Welcome to this seminar, which is part of our Northwest seminar series in mathematical biology and data sciences. And this is jointly organized by University of Manchester, University of Liverpool, and Liverpool John Woods University. I'm delighted to introduce Mo Lutfalahi, our speaker today. Uh, Mo completed his PhD um, from Technical University of Munich not long ago, and he's already has started as a group leader in Welcome Trust. A welcome Sanger Institute. He has received many awards for his research and just to mention one which is Bayer's Foundation Early Excellence in Science Award which he received earlier this year. Um, more of the research is focused on development of machine learning methods for all sorts of single cell biomedical data which he will tell us more in his talk which is titled Generative Modeling of Cellular Niches and Morphology. It's great to have you here Mo. Thank you very much. Zoom floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, like, well, um, and and really happy to be here. Um, well, of course, via Zoom, but I guess, um, yeah, I have uh, I have some stuff going on, so um, couldn't really travel to Manchester, but like it, it was really great last time to be there, and hopefully soon we'll meet all of you in person. Okay. So um, yeah. So today I'm gonna show um some actually new results that uh, from like recent works that uh, and models we've developed to analyze and also um, interpret um, spatial data sets. And during, during this talk, I'll talk about um, two main um, methods. So the first one is called um, IMPA, which is already, um, there's a preprint out there, it's still in revision. And the second one is unpublished and it, it will focus on spatial transcriptomic data. Great. So, um, yeah, so I think we came a long way for um, with, with single cell biology. So, I mean, if you look at like um, 10 years ago, there was like 10, even more like 15 years ago, there was like ball genomics all over the place. And then people usually use like this, the kind of like smoothie um, salad fruit uh, analogy here. And it's it's basically, we came out from like a smoothie where we didn't know about the, the fruits in this in the cell, this individual cells and identities in the tissue. And then the single cell genomics came. So we would be able to kind of like now go from the fruity to individual fruits and which are the cells here. And um, yeah, so numerous method of the year and like advances that single cell biology has made. And um, so recently, um, it's not even that recent anymore, but like the past two years, um, there is a boom in, in basically uh, leveraging spatial biology and to profile not just the expression or omic data, but rather um, also the location and how tissue formation would basically change. Okay. And then, um, so my research uh, as, as, as discussed at the beginning is, is kind of span across multiple um, fields and also like, um, data kind of like if you look at from the data side data types and and but all kind of like centered around how we can leverage single cell biology to understand health and disease but like um we i'm focusing on like um basically how to lever and efficient how to learn efficient patient representation that you would be able to using single cell data to compare similarities and differences across patients and then zooming in into patient data to identify cell type and cell states that <clears throat> That would uh, that differ between um, health and disease, and also between different individuals, and then modeling um, really going in um, delved then into the tissue, but rather single cells here to see whether we can model um, single cell behaviors in response to perturbations and disease, and then zooming out from the the cell types can we actually learn the morphology of like cells in, in space and also the formation of different cell, the cell types um, when they're sitting um, close to each other and how they actually communicate. And in this talk, so I'm not gonna talk about patient cell states and perturbation, but rather focus on the tissue part and morphology. Okay, so um, I'll dive deep into basically the first method here. Um, so we developed a bunch of methods for actually predicting single cell responses to perturbation. Though perturbations could be genetic perturbation, drug perturbations, but they were all on molecular data, so um, transcriptomic data. 
But then um, in, in drug discovery pharma, doing transcriptomics is still expensive. Although there's it has been like a um, surge of like development of cheap and also scalable technology. It's not a technology that you would use to, to screen thousands of drugs using a single cell. So um, then people alluded to cheaper, but more scalable technologies like cell painting, where you actually um, try to paint a certain organelle or <clears throat> protein in the cell and see and profile how these different organelles or um, proteins that you kind of like stain would change after drug or genetic perturbation. So the goal here was develop a generative model that given microscopy data, um, there are multiple protocols out there, for example, cell painting, t glow, but essentially they're all the same. They kind of like try to stain different organelles and they would like to see how these different organelles in a single cell will change after a certain perturbation. But the analysis usually is done on um, not just directly images, but rather converting those images using um, existing software like Cell Profiler and then you know doing that downstream. So the question we tackled here is, can we actually simulate the effect of those perturbations directly on the image? Can we design a function that given an input image of a cell, which is not perturbed, and a drug or a genetic perturbation, and the model will basically generate an image of that exact cell as if it was perturbed with a specific drug. And uh, so, yeah, and we tackled this question and then there, there is a preprint out there, it's called, uh, and the method we developed, it's called IMPA. But what you see here is, is essentially what the model does. So given a control cell, DMSO in terms of like drugs and a conditional generation, conditional on the drug, you would like to predict how the phenotype of that exact cell would be at the image level. And then it's not just imaging, it's not basically just drugs, you can also do it on genetic perturbation and that's basically the building block and uh, the, the core of many um, modern drug discovery and their companies, successful companies like Recursion they are filled solely based on um, large scale microscopy approaches and screening. So we, we formulated the problem and so many of you might have seen this as a style transfer problem where um, there are models out there where you have a content image. So basically an image of a cat, and then you have a certain style. And there is a generative model that combine this, this content with, with the style image that will give you the content image in that desired style, right? So you've seen all the kind of probably like these fancy images of they turn cats into, you know, a, um, a painting painted by Monet and others. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's the same, type of like modeling, but in, in our context, the content image would be the cell, the style would be the drug, and we would like to imagine how that cell would look like if it was perturbed with that specific drug. And um, yeah, so I, I talked about the, the, the content and also the, um, the style. In this case, um, we designed, uh, this is the architecture. So it's kind of like, it's a combination of autoencoders and, and GANs. And um, so as the input, we receive um, the image and then we encode it into a load amount of representation. Um, and then, and so I don't show the, the individual um, building blocks and encoder and decoder, but uh, we use um, standards ResNet um, architecture here to uh, basically infer the C hat I. And the C hat I is, is this content image that I showed uh, in the previous one. Um, then we need to add the style and the style is added by uh, what, 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 what's so-called here as a perturbation encoder. So the perturbation encoder receives um, an, an, um, a representation basically from a perturbation that would be if, if you're using drugs it could be, you know, some drug embeddings obtained from um, a large language model, or you you basically go into um, use some some um, fingerprints, or if it's a genetic perturbation, you can use something like gene to vec or you know represent a gene using different gene programs. So there are like multiple representations for both drugs and um, and genetic perturbations, and here then we inject inject noise to this perturbation representation, and then we mix them using what we call perturbation encoder to infer S hat prime. 
And then um, in multiple layers, we hierarchically add this perturbation represent representation into the image using um, um, what we call like, um, what is, so this is a very well-known injection mechanism. It's called ADA in. So it's, it's very similar to an affine transformation, but we do it on a, uh, on the uh, basically a 3D map, uh, sorry, 2D map, not, not just low dimensional representation. And then using this, the model gradually um, reconstruct what it has to reconstruct on the target part. And then what is reconstructed, which we call X hat I, it's fed into a discriminator network and it has to be realistic enough such that this discriminator would identify and classify it as um, the, the drug uh, and the class of the drug they was supposed to represent. And one last piece here is to really make sure that this perturbation encoder captures semantic information from the image, then we again re-encode this X hat into what we call um, style representation. And then um, there is called, <clears throat> um, so the output of the style encoder. And then we force the model such that the style encoder representation is very close to the perturbation encoder representation to capture meaningful um, styles. And then, then you can like, once you learn this mapping and function, at the test time, then you can kind of like, you know, feed it a um, an, an unperturbed cell and then condition on different drugs, even though that you haven't seen those drugs in the training and predict um, how those drug will, <clears throat> or genetic perturbation will affect your um, image. You can also do synthetic um, interpolation, meaning that you can interpolate between different drugs and different mode of actions to see, for example, like, um, how each drug will change. And basically it would just allow you to kind of tra traverse the manifold to see how different drugs will affect um, the, the image. And then this can be used, for example, for the dose optimization. And then I think what was most interesting is like predicting the unseen drug effects or genetic perturbation, which would be quite essential for designing um, screens in this case. Okay, so I'll show you one example, or like a couple of examples actually here, how this model would work. So given a control cells, um, we trained it on um, a data set uh, containing, I think it's, it's 12 different drugs. And uh, then we um, asked the model, given an unseen image, can the model actually predict how a certain drug would affect the morphology of the cell? So this, this control cell was never seen during the training. And then we, we condition on cytokalazin, which is, the, which is a drug that actually triggers actin degradation. And you can see it's basically the same cell, but the model kind of like removed the background, added this, 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 this kind of like artifacts on the actin. So these, these red dots. And um, since, this, since this is an unpaired data, meaning that you don't have the, the results. So basically you don't have the phenotype before and after um, the, the drug um, screening. So we, we actually have to look at the individual uh, the other cells in the data set to see whether we can capture kind of like capture the, the phenotype. And you can see if you look at the target phenotype, it's kind of like conceptually very similar to the for the prediction. But this is like visually, but then we later quantitatively also measure this. Another example is um, where you have a drug that actually causes a uh, loss of nuclear nuclear integrity. So you can see that given the controlled image, then you, you have the prediction and it's kind of like also again, similar to some um, target phenotype. But then the question is, okay, these are all images, but then can you actually quantify how good you perform or whether you actually learn some average effect? Are you actually operating on that organelle of target, a target organelle that you should really operate or not? So to really evaluate this, we came up with a baseline and the baseline is basically control, those DMSO. So whatever the model does, it has to change the model in a good way to really, you know, um, push the model, push the image from the DMSO phenotype to so the control phenotype. And then we use some downstream. Um, so basically we use cell profiler to feed in the generated images and also the target images from the same drug. And then we looked at the features, the hand designed features that were basically picked to separate um, or to demonstrate the changes in, in, in actin. And what you see here is 
um, you'll see the difference. So the distribution of what we predicted on the pixel level versus the distribution of target phenotypes. And you can see that, um, that where the control is and where the generated images distribution is. And it's kind of very similar to the um, true drug phenotype. And you can see it for the other drug um, too. Okay. And you can even visualize this. If you project the image into this hand-picked features, and then you apply a UMAP on this low dimensional, um, I think it's kind of like 50 features. And um, you can see that, so the basically the light blue ones are the are the input image at the test time. And the uh, and the <clears throat> and the red, dark red, and also the 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 light red one here is uh, are basically the the predicted and also the true phenotype here. And you can see the distribution kind of like matches. So we basically quantitatively based on the <clears throat> um, features, you can show like the, it, it's basically operating on the right set of features. And um, then we came up with like five metrics here. And these metrics basically uh, look at different um, things in the image, basically. How, how good do you match the distribution of um, generated images to the distribution of the ground truth? Um, if you also design a classifier to classify which drug is this, is the image that generated by your model would be classified as the target drug. And um, also FID, which is also another um, metric um, commonly used in generative um, AI and assessment of how real images are. And, um, and then what we show here is um, we basically um, achieve 15% uh, improvement to the state of the art model out there for this task. And here's another example, but not on the um, prediction, but rather on the interpolation. So in this case, we picked the DMSO and then we fit it into the model. And then we did a linear interpolation going from the DMSO to um, AZ258 drug, right? And, um, and you can see above, you can see the images that are generated. So once you go from the DMSO to the, to the target drug, and at the bottom, then you see the result of the classifier designing which uh, classifying which drug is this. So you basically go from DMSO and then the classifier kind of get confused in between. And in the end, you can recover um, the target phenotype just by interpolating the space of drugs. And um, so once we were sure about the ability to interpolate, um, then we saw to see, okay, uh, can we actually now extrapolate to unseen drugs? Um, so we've shown similar result on um, single cell transcriptomics. So there is a model out there um, called ChemCPA published last year in Europe where we actually show it's possible to predict if the molecular responses to unseen drugs. So here, um, what we did out of the, like um, I think like 10, 12 drugs that were in this data set, we left out a bunch of these drugs uh, that were chemically similar um, structurally actually similar to the training drug and also drugs that were like um, way different than um, than, than um, training drugs, right? And um, so it's not necessarily um, kind of like, it's not fully correct to say that if you have drugs with similar structure, you will always end up to have similar phenotype if you treat a drug. But that, that would be true for many of the drugs. And um, so in this case, we wanted to see where the model would work. It, does it actually work if you test it on unseen drugs that are structurally similar? And what will happen for uh, drugs that are not very similar? And so first, the model can generalize to the drugs that are structurally similar to the training. And then for, 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 for what you see on the heat map is actually Tanimoto similarity, which people actually use a lot for um, comparing drug fingerprints. And then um, there are some artifacts actually when you predict the drugs that are not similar. So we wanted to show that, you know, how good you can generalize and then where the model will actually fail. And those failure modes will be the case where you actually deviate a lot from your um, chemical distribution of training drugs. There is really no model out there for this. Um, there is just one model called Malto Image. And this is kind of different from what we have with IMPA uh, because um, with IMPA, we, it's actually image to image translation. 
So you can actually, you know, operate on the exact same image that you input to the model and then see how that exact image would change. Whereas for model to image, it's a flow-based model and this operates on, um, it actually goes from molecules to images. So you don't have control over specific single cell here. So you can just like, you know, after training the model, you can just ask, okay, I have this structure, give me some images um, that that might have, um, um, so basically the, 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 the output of, or like the, the response of the drug um, in, in those, so you don't have the control over, you know, to do counterfactuals. Yeah, so the, using the same metrics, then we can see almost like 85% um, improvement. I mean, we re really like kind of tried hard to make this model work and we even contacted authors and they kind of helped, but still like um, when, when you operate on these like image, image to image tasks and like drug data, it's, it's really hard to see what works or not. But yeah, um, so even on this, this harder task, we got like kind of like 85%. So you see minus 85%, but it's like kind of like 85% improvement because the metrics are actually the other way around. Okay. And um, then going beyond um, drug perturbation, um, we also tested the model on how you can actually simulate um, genetic perturbation effects. So these are um, two different data sets coming from, one comes from um, recursion. So um, a, a pharmaceutical company actually um, heavily investing in cell painting and phenotypic screening using microscopy. And the other one comes from uh, Broad Institute and um, Anna Carpenter. She's, she's basically one of the pioneers and the, the one who actually developed cell painting. And what you see here is not basically, is not just predicting the images. What you see, since we had this perturbation encoder, we, you can actually identify which genetic perturbation or which perturbation would induce similar phenotype, not just in the image level, but just looking at the style representation, perturbation encoder, and how different drugs um, are kind of like um, uh, positioned in that space. Because that space, so this per the output of this perturbation encoder is actually um, shaped via or driven by um, Sim, uh, phenotypic similarities of different genetic perturbation. So you can see um, on the right, um, each dot is actually an average style effect of that genetic perturbation. So we have like, um, like more than 1,000 genetic perturbation and then like close to 100,000 images. So each dot is basically an average um, phenotype of different um um, genetic perturbations. And what we show here, because um, it's kind of like harder in this case to go and do one by, by one by one analysis. What we show here is if you really traverse this manifold, there are like on the right side, if you look at the, 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 the color map, we basically subtracted the average style effect from the DMSO, from the control. And um, so all the, all the genetic perturbation, which really didn't have much impact on the morphology are kind of like clustered on the right. And whereas more um, pronounced effects and the genetic perturbation that did um, a lot to the cell are on the left. And you can see some example images here, but then like, again, going to the quantitative analysis. So it's, it's really hard to kind of um, um, scale a bunch of these models, um, but um, indeed we, um, and, and this is um, actually a harder task than predicting the drug effects because the, the the responses are quite subtle in this case, and it's kind of hard for them all to capture this. And that's why we also added this baseline, which is basically the control cells. And then um, even in this case, we can see some improvement over existing work. Okay, great. Um, just to be sure, how 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 much time do I have? Um, you have until about 25, 30 minutes. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay. okay, just two, yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, yeah, so I kind of like shift gears here a bit and then go deeper into, like go away a bit from morphology, but still remain in the spatial world. Um, so I, I talked about spatial transcriptomic and, um, and how it can kind of like help to um, elucidate um, uh, cellular niches, tissues, and et cetera. But I mean, still not, it's not still very trivial how to analyze this data set especially in multi-condition, multi-sample setting. Because in this case, you get different slices of tissue 
And um, it's not really trivial how to kind of integrate multiple slices. So people take multiple approaches. For example, they usually come up with a template and they try to align all the tissue slices into a pre-designed template. And um, so that's basically the first challenge that exists in the spatial transcriptomic data set analysis. And the second one is, um, it's not really trivial to how to separate and under to how to recover cellular niches, because in this case, you're not really interested to recover cell types, right? Because that's what you could have done with single cell data, single cell RNA-seq or chromatin accessibility or whatever is out there for, for, for molecular profiling. Here, you would like to understand the cell-cell interactions. So you would like to recover clusters that are ideally from multiple cell types, for example, so that shows there is a cell-cell communication. And again, that's not also quite straightforward. So because you need to have a latent space, which is spatially um, aware, and then you kind of like keep the distance and you try to kind of like, you know, um, understand the tissue rather than the cell type. And the last challenge is say that we, um, we recovered niches, right? And now we would like to functionally annotate those niches. What are the cell types within those niches which are communicating? What are the ligand receptors that are they use, uh, that they're kind of using? So, um, and there are individual methods for <clears throat> each of these challenges. And, um, and this is a work by um, um, a, a very talented PhD student, Sebastian Burke, um, co-supervised by me and Carlos Talavara. And um, so we developed what we called niche campus to basically address all those three challenges. Um, to really go away from, from this whole template matching framework to integrate across multiple um, spatial data sets, we will present each spatial data set as a graph. So uh, building the graph based on, uh, so for each cell, because you know the X and Y, basically, you know the position of the cell in the tissue. We look at the, the a certain radius around the cell and this is again, another hyperparameter then it kind of like can change the results based on how you make this graph. But then we can make it, we can represent the whole tissue based on the graph and the connectivity comes from the, the, the adjacency metrics that you build based on X and Y. So you represent the cell, sorry, the tissue and each data set and each sample using a graph. And what you like to ideally do in this case is actually a graph matching problem where you know instead of like being worried about a template you try to learn a representation such that similar tissue sorry similar neighborhoods with similar cellular composition would be embedded close to each other and in this graph um representation then you can have uh, so there's there's a there's an adjacency matrix that you have to build and then you can build it across multiple samples and the, and the features could be, um, for example, gene expression, chromatin accessibility, um, depending on the spatial technology they're using, or some sort of like co-founders, you can also account for the patients um, or batches and et cetera. And this is for the first challenge, how to integrate it. But then let's say you integrate it and now you have a meaningful representation, then you need to have a, a mean to analyze cell-cell communication. And the, the language of cell-cell communication and signaling is ligand receptors. So you need to know what are the ligands and what are the receptors that these cells are actually using and what are the target genes that they, they might actually change after this communication. So what we did, with, we actually injected some domain knowledge into this model. And the domain knowledge could come from like, you know, expert or databases. And these databases could be in different forms. It could be just ligand and receptor. It could be ligand receptor and targets. It could be um, combined interaction programs, meaning that you have ligand receptor, transcription factor, or even metabolites that are mediated by cell cell communication. And there are like a bunch of data sets, databases out there. And, 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 and using niche campus, we can like treat it as unbiased, meaning that you can use multiple databases at the same time. Okay, what do we do with this? Um, since if we so since we represented the, the the whole sample with the graph and also we have the domain knowledge here, um, then we apply the graph encoder, and this graph encoder could be a an intention transformer or like I mean we just treat it as a black box here, right? So it's it's, it's a geometric deep learning um, backbone that um, encode the graph. 
So in the end, for each cell, you get an embedding. And that embedding basically is is um, is distance aware, and um, and it's also updated by the individual neighbors around that specific cell to really enforce the model to preserve the the space and then keep the cell cell distances. We actually reconstruct the adjacency matrix from this low dimensional representation. So we have a decoder that goes back to the adjacency matrix and the model has to do good basically in this case, not to just, you know, learn any latent space, but the latent space that you um, can reconstruct the adjacency matrix and the spatial coordinates represented as a graph. And then to bring in this interpretability, we enforce the model such that each latent dimension in this model would reconstruct a um, known ligand receptor and target interaction. And this is actually enforced by a mask decoder. So each latent dimension here for, and, and it depends how you model this, whether you look at it from the sender cell or receiver cell, let's say if you're a sender, what you like to know is basically you would be able to reconstruct your own ligand, the expression of your own ligand, and also the receptor of your neighboring cells, and also the target genes in your neighbor cells and also yourself, right? And then when we constrain this model to only work on a known set of ligand and receptors we get from the databases. And this way you can go back to the expression space. So this, this latent space is constrained using both molecular information and also the um, adjacency matrix and the spatial information. Um, yeah, and then I'll show you one example and how you can use this in practice is the collaboration with Omar Bayraktar, group leader, faculty at Sanger Institute. <clears throat> what we did in this analysis was we applied niche campus on a mouse embryogenesis data set. So what you see here is um, the histology of three different mouse embryos in, um, in different ages from eight to 12 of somatic stages. And um, this is the slide seek um, data set, you have like almost 300 genes here. And what you see here is basically different cell types projected on the histology um, by original authors. So if you apply a niche campus, you get something like this. So instead of like, you know, looking at these three different embryos individually, you get the latent space where you now actually integrate it across all these three different embryos. And you can see it on the right side. And on the left side, um, I'll show you in the next slide how we annotated those different niches, but those are basically cellular niches that we annotated using niche campus. So you can see like how different embryos are kind of like mixed, but as one example, you can look at, because in, in this kind of latent spaces, you're interested to see if you actually integrated similar neighborhoods across different embryos into the same place or close to each other, right? And what you see here, that those highlighted niche here, um, those are basically uh, four brain, right? And if you do the clustering on this latent space and the cluster that you find, and we later, later annotated as a four brain, if you project that cluster and the cells that are in those cluster into the histology, they all end up to be in the four brain region of different mouse embryos, meaning that the mole end up kind of like learned a meaningful representation in this case. And then this is actually where the gene programs on those databases and what we call communication programs come to play. Because the model is a probabilistic, so it's a generative model. You can go on the latent space and then perform like some sort of like hypothesis test, saying that I found this cluster which represents a niche. What are the gene programs, communication programs that can separate this niche from others? And the model, based on the domain knowledge that it has, it will give you, um, let's say, the top end. Um, communication program that can separate this niche versus others. And this is a Bayesian um, testing. So you get like log base factors and other things. And what you see here is the average activity of all those clusters that I showed in the previous slide and the top two gene programs that can separate these clusters versus others. So in the heat map, you can see the activity of these different gene programs and they're uniquely enabled to separate the, the niches, specific niche from the others. And if you do a simple dendrogram analysis, literally like a very simple hierarchical clustering, you can see that the similar niches that or the niches that belong to a certain tissue, they kind of like group together and then you can go back to the whole anatomy from these different niches. And that shows that the mole actually learned a meaningful 
um, niches and tissue representation. And obviously on the right, <clears throat> then you can see the composition of these different niches. So it kind of shows that they're not all from the um, same cell type. There are some niches that are dominated by a certain cell type, but then um, it's usually a mix of multiple cell types. So that was a global picture, but you can actually go deeper into these niches that we found. So, and then for example, here we zoomed it into uh, GOT. And then we, I, we wanted to identify which communication program or gene program can separate dorsal versus um, ventral GOT. So here you can see SPINT1, and these are like known um, gene programs that drive uh, GOT development. And uh, so the first panel is, is actually where the GOT is in one of the embryos, uh, in dorsal and ventral. And the second panel is the activity of the gene program learned by the model. And in the, in the last two panels, then you see the expression of the target genes um, that are in GOT. Uh, and then you can um, see that like first the original expression and the one that actually the model reconstructed. The same analysis could be done, but then separating ligand and receptor. So again, in GOT, you can pick up VTN program. So this VTN program uh, is, is also a ligand here. And you can see the expression of ligand and the expression of top receptors. So those are not just limited to the dorsal and ventral gods. So there are also some neighboring uh, niches. And on the right, you also see the top target genes that are regulated by this ligand and receptor. And using this, then you can actually build a niche-niche uh, communication graph. So basically using the activity of this model that we learned, right? we build a graph and, the, and then the, the edges between these different nodes that are represented by niches, they are actually um, the number of cells in each niche communicating. And then the, 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 the thickness of the line kind of shows what is going on in each niche. But then what you see here is a lot of like within niche communication is going on within ventral god. And that's what you see it in the, what you can also see in the ligand. There's, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's very um, strong signal in the ligand. And then um, and then in the receptor, that receptor is kind of like on our, uh, are in the neighboring niches, but the neighboring niches are um, uh, kind of like represented um, in, in the graph, but in, at the bottom, you can also see the histology that um, where these cells are, they're actually in the um, neighborhood of um, rental god. Okay. And then we did the same analysis for brain. And in this case, we actually recovered floor plate and a gene program um, called calci A, which was known not known before. Um, and I mean, there are like a lot of known, known biology here, like sonic hedgehog, a hedgehog basically regulating the brain development, also gene programs um, that can separate different brain regions. But what we showed here is using this model, no other analysis, you can basically identify niches and uniquely separate different brain regions, forebrain, hindbrain, midbrain, and even identifying floor plate, which is really hard to identify using transcription, um, transcriptional data. And then we identified calci a previously not reported um, gene program um, regulating floor plate development. Okay, so that were just some, some vignettes. And then we have also other vignettes on cancer, um, even multimodal analysis. Um, but then like the question is, um, you know, how sure are we about this whole integration? I mean, are we just like, you know, integrating stuff, smooshing things on the top of each other, you know, um, it, 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 so we, when we started the project, um, I mean, I think still the, the, it's not really straightforward to even look at it just using transcriptomic data, whether you can just, you know, integrate stuff by, and like, there's a trade-off between you know, mixing data sets and how well you preserve the biology, right? And um, in this case, it, it even gets more complicated because you're also dealing with space. So you have to integrate across samples while also preserving the local neighborhood, global neighborhood, and also some notion of cell type and clusterability. So this is one example that we actually compare our model on how well it can represent um, spatial niches, and then we applied it on, on, on this data set from Mao's hippocampus. So on the left, you can see some expert annotated um, um, picture of how a, a mouse hippocampus separates into multiple layers. And on the right, you'll see the result of 
applying niche campus on this data set and then applying a clustering algorithm on the latent space of niche campus and then um you know see if we can actually recover this this different layers of um different cortical layers in mouse brain and then the same analysis here then we show that you can if you do a clustering on this then you can you know go back and then reconstruct um higher level um tissue structures but then the question is oops um, how does other models actually perform? There are some models out there just to kind of learn spatially aware representations. So graph is the sage net, deep link, and et cetera. And then we compared niche campus to a bunch of these models. I mean, these models are not able to annotate niches and et cetera. It's just like, you know, they learn this spatial representations. And what you can see here, um, um, some models are really like doing, I mean, the sage net, sage net and deep link. Um, they kind of like, lose the spatial variability. So for example, I mean, we highlighted pieces that are kind of like this model made um, incorrect choices, uh, but whereas where niche campus, there is this, this very um, complicated structure and cortical layers at the at the top of, um, of the hippocampus, where you can see those like greenish purplish uh, clusters that are well-structured in niche campus. Whereas in graph is the kind of like they're all pushed together. So you lose some sort of heterogeneity at the bottom. But again, this is all visual comparison. And to really quantify this, then we came up with a set of metrics. And these set of metrics, they actually check how well you actually preserve the um, local neighborhood, how good you work on the global picture, and, um, and how good you were able to recover solar niches. And um, and using this, like, um, I think there are like six different metrics, then you can see, for example, like niche campus um, outperform um, existing metrics, like the state of the art here, which is this graph is deep thingy. And it, it gets even much worse. The performance of other methods just on the integration task is way worse than single sample because the previous one was actually single sample. So no batch correction, no... Um, um, tissue matching or um, sample matching. In this case, we applied <clears throat> niche campus on a cancer data set. So this is small long cell uh, nanostring, um, small long cancer. And um, so this data set come from three different biological replicates measuring the same area and the tissue, right? And then if you apply a niche campus and graph SD, you would expect niches from this similar area or um, point of view or FOVs would be integrated close to each other. So those highlighted cluster in niche campus representing endothelial and also plasma blast, and then projecting those on the histology at different replicates, you can see they're kind of like all aligned in the same cluster. So if you look at the replicate and then if you go back to the niche campus, you can see one big um, blue cluster, for example. Whereas in graph SD, especially in the stroma and endothelial part, there is a clear batch effect from replicate two that the model couldn't really take care of, right? And um, and then you can see the composition of the niches here. And also on the right side, you can see it colored by different replicates. So they're basically the same niche, the same neighborhood, but then one of the models actually clustered it as a different entity rather than the same thing, you know, being the same. So you can really see it on a microscope there and it's from the same place. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully this will be out soon in the next week. Uh, and then we have a lot of like cool vignettes from cancer to cell cell communication, but we also uh, interested in other problems as I kind of like mentioned. And yeah, with this, I like you thank I'd like to thank um, a lot of collaborators and also founders who um, helped us to um, show what you saw today. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions.